Before I get started, shout out to my dad, who is in the audience and also was up after midnight helping me make these slides. Thank you, dad. All right, now that you've all had a chance to look at this slide for a bit, what, what kind of computer did you picture? Um, you know, maybe you pictured something like this, maybe you went a bit older, picked the kind of computer that I first played around with, or uh, maybe you went even like more old school, went back to the kind of computers before cats had discovered that they were fun to sit on. Um, <laughs> But you know, did you guys picture these guys? I mean, maybe you did actually, because maybe you like heard the title of my talk and you're like, oh, we're going to talk about bacteria. But uh, I actually think it's super cool to think about the way that bacteria are similar to computers. Um, so they they swim around, they change their shape, uh, they chase after food, they collaborate with each other. There's clearly some computational power underneath that cell membrane. They're clearly processing a lot of signals. Uh, but there's also a lot of important ways that bacteria are not like computers. Um, you know, sort of some obvious ones, they're, they're slimy, they're not like an artificial pancreas. Um, but I think one of the most exciting things to me and to other synthetic biologists is that there's a lot of ways that you can make bacteria more like computers. So we really love to talk about genetic circuits in bacteria, and I'm going to talk about some, and you know, they're, they're pretty cool, you can do great things with them, and the circuit components inside of bacteria are like way more annoying than the circuit components inside of your computer. So what, what are those? You know, life is not logical. It is hard to put nor gates in bacteria. That is because the inside of bacteria, that computation is this kind of ridiculous intersection of DNA and protein and RNA interactions, and it's all, it's all kind of muddled up. So we're, we're going to briefly flash back to high school. DNA, double helix. And the sort of central idea of, of cellular biology is that you have your DNA, and it makes RNA, and then that ends up making proteins, which go off and do most of the work in the cell. And then there's a lot of crosstalk in this where then, you know, sometimes the proteins go back and they affect the DNA. Sometimes the DNA actually regulates the RNA and sometimes protein regulates the RNA and DNA regulates itself and you get this kind of genetic spaghetti code with crazy dependencies. Uh, it's, <laughs> it's, like pretty, it's pretty hard to engineer. But when we started being able to read the code in more detail, which, which really only happened maybe 20, 25 years ago, uh, people started looking at it and they went, wait a minute, this is you know, all of these interactions, they're making decisions. We can kind of model these the way that we model computers where we're, we're doing Boolean logic decisions. So we're gonna, let's talk a bit about Boolean logic. So Boolean, we, we like those, we got our ones, got our zeros. Inside of a computer, that kind of means we got high voltage and low voltage. And we are passing around this high voltage and this low voltage using transistors. Transistors are great. Let's talk about why transistors are great. Transistors are really fast. So even back when we were using, you know, electromechanical relays, 1930s and 40s, that really old picture I showed you of a computer, those, those switches could switch back and forth about 50 times per second, which I think is really fast. But transistors, the ones that we have today, they can switch back and forth billions of times a second. So they're like incredibly speedy. Uh, they're also quite robust. Transistors are this compact semiconductor sandwich. So they're not like relays that bend. They're not like vacuum tubes that you can smash. They're, they really last quite a long time. And lastly, and maybe the greatest thing about transistors is that they work well in teams. So the input to your transistor is your high or your low voltage, and it's outputting a high or low voltage, which you can then use as an input to another transistor. And you can chain them together, and they, they all talk to each other, and they, they work really well together. So, you know, they're fast, they're robust, and they are composable. Let's all take a moment to appreciate transistors. Yay, transistors. Yeah, they're so good. Yes, Appla applaud for transistors. They're excellent. Um, and you don't actually need much more than a couple of transistors to build a general computer. So I said we would talk about NOR gates. NOR means not or. So what that translates to is that if you have these two inputs, A and B, and you have an output, if you have a low voltage on both of your inputs, zero and zero, then you get a high output voltage, a one. And if you have just B high, low, just A high, low, both high, low. It's mostly low, it's only when you have neither of your input signals that you get a high output voltage. And this might not seem like much, but you can actually build, you, these are Boolean complete. And Boolean complete means that you can represent all of Boolean algebra just using NOR gates. And, you know, this is actually a picture of some of the schematics for the Apollo guidance computer, which, you know, went to the moon, and it was only NOR gates. It was just 5,000 NOR gates. So I, I think that's, that's pretty cool. You can, you can do pretty general computing with NOR gates. 
So can we, can we build NOR gates out of this DNA to RNA to protein to kind of regulatory mess that I talked about before? We totally can, and I will, I will show you how. So when we are thinking about DNA, we're thinking about expressing genes. And what happens is you have this molecule called RNA polymerase, and it comes and it sort of skims along your DNA, and then it goes off and it makes a protein. And what we are going to do to engineer this is we're going to make the promoters stronger or weaker. So we're going to affect the ability of the RNA polymerase to make um, RNA, which will then affect how much protein we end up with at the end. So how do we make them stronger? We activate them. So you can put in these activator chemicals, then they pull RNA polymerase over, and you have a bunch of RNA polymerase, and you're making way more of the, the RNA and then the protein than you would otherwise. Or you can repress the promoter. So you can, you can put a repressor over top of the promoter, and then the RNA polymerase tries to access it, but it can't, and so it sort of goes off sadly, and it doesn't, we will not be making any protein today. Um, <laughs> Yeah, and so this is actually, you already now know all the things you need to know to put a norgate in bacteria. Um, so I, I will take you through that in case that's, you know, not, not immediately obvious to you. So, yeah. So here our input uh, is not going to be voltage. Our input is going to be these activator chemicals. And so our, you know, our activator A um, in our input, it's going to go and it's going to activate this promoter. Um, in our activator B, it's going to go activate another promoter. Um, and then these... These are going to produce proteins that are going to carry our signal through our, through our little circuit, and they're going to produce two repressor proteins. Um, so now, now we go over to the other part of our circuit, to our output. So we have no repressor proteins. Awesome. We get, we get our, our fancy little protein. But if we have our chemical A present, we've got a repressor protein, covers up our promoter. Chemical B present, covers up our promoter. Both of them, covers them up. And it was slightly more detail. So this is what I showed you before. Uh, neither input signal is present, neither of the activator chemicals. We get our proteins. That's actually zero, zero, one. All right, more biology, it's come in. Now if we have A present, that activator chemical, we are covering up the promoter, and we don't get any of our output proteins, so we get a, a zero, a low, low signal. Um, if we just have B present, we're still covering up the promoter, we still get a low signal, and if you have both of them, you get double repression. There's like definitely no protein coming out here. Um, and so we have now actually put the whole Norgate circuit into bacteria. So I, I think this is really cool. I'm like, oh, great, we made bacteria into a computer. Sort of. So the bacteria are not exactly like computers. So I, I, we talked about all of these reasons that transistors are amazing. Spoiler alert, bacteria are not like this. So bacterial gates are not speedy. It takes about five minutes from when you put that activator chemical in to when you get that re repressor protein out. And that's like, that's a really good case. Uh, sometimes to get a signal in these kinds of circuits, it takes literal hours. So, you know, you thought the relays 50 times a second, they weren't so fast compared to transistors. These are really slow <laughs> compared to transistors. Um, they are not robust. So bacteria are living systems. They like to survive. When we are putting NOR gates into bacteria, we are putting a bunch of extra DNA and proteins that they don't necessarily want. Like they didn't necessarily consent to this. And they're really good at mutating. So they might just get rid of the gates. They might just mutate them out of their genomes. So if you put your you know, Apollo guidance bacteria and you're sending them to the moon, halfway to the moon, they, the computer might not be in them anymore. They might have just got rid of all the NOR gates. There's a thing the bacteria can do. Um, and they do not work well in teams. So there's no wires inside of a bacteria. It's all just one big chemical soup. So this means there's some things where like, oh, if you have a chemical that changes the pH, the bacteria might just die. You know, there's, there's a lot of risks there. But it also means if you have an activator chemical for a specific promoter, you can't reuse that promoter somewhere else. Um, there's a lot of crosstalk in your circuit because there's no wires. Um, so bacterial gates, they are slow, they are fragile, and they are not very composable. So life is not logical. It is hard to put NOR gates in bacteria. Why, why bother at all then, if it's, if it's so difficult? Well, this is cool. I, I really think that's enough of a reason to do science. It's really cool. I want to make bacteria like computers, because I think both computers and bacteria are really interesting. Um, but it's also getting easier. I would love to talk to you guys at length, although I don't have time, about all of the things we have done since we did that first Norgate, which was actually built in 2002 to make these better, which is you know flipping around DNA and putting random shared chemicals into, the, into that chemical soup. There's a lot of really interesting stuff. And synthetic biology is a super exciting field that has a lot of need for computer science, so come, come do synthetic biology. It's great. Um, and it can also do really good things. You know, I would love to have bacteria in my gut that can tell if I'm getting sick. I would love to have bacteria in the, my water that can tell if there's arsenic in them. People have built Norgate classifiers that uh, check cancer cells, or check your cells to see if they're cancerous. 
there's a lot of really powerful things that biology can do, and I think if we can learn to program biology the way we can program computers, we will be able to do really good things. So, life is not logical, but let's make bacterial computers anyway. <laughs>